Hello. Today we're gonna try something a little different. I've had uh, rambles before, but they've always just been kind of ill-conceived thoughts that just kind of go on. But I've been watching a lot of um, Alex Soth's videos where he discusses like photo books and whatnot. And he has like a very pointed lecturing style, which I definitely appreciate because there's there's a story being told, you know, there's like an objective that's being sought after. I'm trying to find a way to implement that into some of these rambles that I have. Because this ramble is kind of important to me. It has nothing to do with this K1000 that needs to be fixed. Okay, so I was having a conversation with someone this past weekend, and he was uh, one of these like hype beast digital photographer types and he's trying to explain to me like how film photography works while not understanding like my background in it so that was kind of funny but then he was talking about like and that, so I'm gonna say words that make him sound a lot smarter than he was but he really wasn't like he didn't come across to me as uh, someone who really had a good idea of what he was trying to say, but he was trying to tell me about the merits of like instant film. And, and typically when the topic of instant film comes up, especially with like most just average consumers, the first thing that comes to mind is usually like the Instax, like the, um, like one of these, the Instax minis or maybe even like an Instax wide or something, but this is like a very common and very accessible consumer instant camera. Honestly, it, like the film is super cheap for it. The quality is like passable. There isn't any grounds for use of this in like a very serious professional way. Like it's very yeah, amateur-ish, I will say, but it's a great camera. Like, I love these things, so I don't want it to sound like I'm just talking trash about the Instax. The picture of that thing is very tiny, so anyway, it doesn't matter. So that's typically what's discussed. But in my mind, whenever I think of instant film, I always go back to Polaroids, because that's what I started with, was I had a Polaroid land camera, one with like the rainbow stripes. It looked like the old Instagram logo, and I bought it at a, a garage sale for like five dollars and I had it forever it never really worked too well like the lens was super foggy and the rollers didn't work so all the photos I got from it were just horrible but I, I just I loved the idea of it like I loved the idea of just having something with you that you could capture a memory on like a tangible physical item as opposed to something like a cell phone or like a digital camera where you can take a bunch of pictures you can send them to people and stuff like that and that's still very special it doesn't create the same interaction because you don't have that physical interface with the the physical item like developmentally we have a strong connection to scarcity and i think that's like like our mind factors resources you know whether that's like limited amount of water at the watering hole like back in the old back in the old days or like lack of food all of these things like our mind clings on to these things and it becomes more important so if you only have like one physical item of something especially if it's something that you link to a memory then it's likely to be more important you know and the same thing can be said for you know other film photography because you have like the negative but that's also different because that's more of like a delayed gratification when are you going to get the film developed when are you going to get the scans done so you can actually see what you have and a lot of negatives well negatives themselves aren't like positive slides where if you look at a negative you don't see the image you see the negative of the image that's why it's called a negative but you don't see that image so your mind doesn't really have that same connection to it whereas something like a polaroid print you see that and it recreates that memory in your mind so so i think that that's that's like the psychological effects that 
uh, Polaroids have, and this is all unfounded, really. This is just my my thoughts on it. So I could be very wrong, but this is my video, so bear with me. But let's talk about Polaroid in general because I, I think that it's a really interesting tale of one of like the largest companies in the, the photography community that essentially went bankrupt, uh, which is a reoccurring theme because film photography is kind of inherently outdated at this point. Just with the introduction of really high-end digital options and such and the fast-paced nature of our world, digital just makes so much more sense, but I prefer shooting film because I'm difficult and I think that it still has merits, but point being, most people, most consumers would see digital option where it's like a one-time investment as much more cost-effective than a continual investment into something that has mixed results. So, let's discuss Polaroid. One of the, like, the interesting things though, so I was reading this book and it was called The Money Game and it was written in like the 80s by a guy, I don't remember what his name was, but he was like a Harvard, Harvard graduate, he worked on Wall Street, but he used a pen name, Adam Smith, to write these books. And it was a really interesting book, really helped me understand like the functions of the stock market and how essentially all of it's really just a game. Like it's the people that the stockbrokers and stuff could care less about whether or not they make money. It's a whole thing, doesn't matter. But one of the things I found very interesting was that he would regularly talk about like the sure thing, like stocks that were just always steadily on the rise. And the two that I remember off the top of my head that he mentioned were like Xerox and Polaroid. And where we're at now in 2021, um, Polaroid is so far below what it used to be. You know, Polaroid used to just be this juggernaut of industry. And then through a series of events, just failed completely. And then now it's like on this path to resurgence, but still it's, it's not the same. It probably will never be the same. But Polaroid was founded in 1937. Edwin H. Land. What a name. Uh, he founded Polaroid in 1937, and this was basically, the company was founded around the principle of instant photography. And initially what it was, was something like a much bigger version of one of these. Um, it was one of like the original like land cameras. They were huge, but they had these rollers. Get this out. They had rollers like that there. Put the exposure of film into here. And close that up. You would take the picture, and then you'd pull that out, and that would basically engage the chemicals and create and start to develop the image. That's how it became instant, basically. So it's a very interesting concept, especially at the time, because it was 1937, but, and gradually over time, they created better methods to do it, to where it was all a single pack, like the 600 film, or the iType film, or even like the Instax film is just a recreation of that where on the bottom little packet is all of the chemicals and then the picture portion of the film is just like the light sensitive crystals and stuff like that. So that is that. Uh, then to bookend the founding of the company, Polaroid declared bankruptcy in 2008. In 2017, May of 2017, it was acquired by the largest shareholder, which was Impossible Project. Impossible Project kind of brought back Polaroid. I remember this because I think I got my camera, my initial camera, I think it was probably about 2016, I want to say. And I remember film was like super hard to come by, but then it became more ubiquitous. And then in September of 2017, they changed the name kind of back to Polaroid Originals. And then in March of 2020, this past year, 
they changed the name just to Polaroid. And what's interesting is I have two things here. I don't remember when I bought this film, but it was obviously before March, because it says Polaroid Originals. And then I bought this not too long ago. You can see it just says Polaroid. So, kind of interesting if you're into that kind of thing. Also, the coloring is different now that I'm looking at them side by side. Very strange. Huh. Great design of the packaging, though. Like, I just, I enjoy this quite a bit. Anyway, doesn't matter. We will get back to that. There's a lot of other things. This is just a brief overview. So, the other thing that I really wanted to point out was Kodak being the very interesting company that they continue to be in 1976 decided to start producing their own instant film and it came in the form of the color burst which is just the most grotesque looking camera in my opinion like it just it's such a dorky looking thing i don't own one but i do have the bag i have like the bag for it it's just like this big bulky bag it has like a fun little logo on it and there's like fur on the inside it's pretty great and you can put a lot of stuff in it, so like, shoot, why not keep it? It's like this brown leather thing. Love it. And the camera itself has like, like a leather cushion on the front of it. It's it's very strange. I'll put a picture of it right there. So that's the color burst. Um, immediately, Polaroid filed a lawsuit for, you know, infringement on, like their product, and it lasted about ten years. I want to say, and they had. Uh, it was like a 12 billion, they like required or requested 12 billion dollars from Kodak, which I think probably at the time had that kind of money, but I think they ended up paying like 900 million or something, something crazy like that. So, oh my God, I just figured out where this came from. Okay, this is like a total sidetrack, but I was looking at this piece. I've been looking at this piece in particular forever because um, it's just been sitting on my desk and I have no clue where it came from. And then I've got this Minolta SRT that I kind of tore apart. And I realized that this just goes right in there. And this is like the aperture preview. Oh, that, that makes me so happy. Okay, sorry for that quick departure there. Back to Polaroid. Big lawsuit. Uh, Kodak stopped producing them. And then in the camera bag that I have, was the lawsuit paper like from Kodak to the person who bought the color burst basically explaining the lawsuit and why they will no longer produce the color burst film so just a fun bit of history but let's get into the cameras here well I have a couple of the Polaroid offerings of film um, I think there's talks of them producing a new line of cameras with different kinds of film. I don't know anything about that, but this is just what I have with me right now. There are three types of film that are being produced currently. There's the 600, SX70, and then the iType film. I don't have an iType camera, so I don't have any iType film. But I do have this as well, and this is 669 film. So let's get into this first because this is the most popular I would say it goes into a camera it's like this produced in like the late 80s and the 90s just a very basic hunk of plastic kind of camera you just push this forward you can see right there it says 600 film so that loads into here and then you're basically good to go well, you have to use this film because this actually has a battery in the pack. So I have an old pack here. And this is the battery contacts right there. So demonstration purposes, in case you have no idea what I'm talking about. Right now, you open this up and nothing. But if I were to load this empty, see, it loads, you can hear the flash charging, and then 
this will maybe turn on. Yep, because it's ready to take a picture. And that nothing's gonna come out because it's empty, as I said, but still. And then you take this out. And now this is just plastic. So this is obviously kind of an expensive procedure. And that's why the I-Type was developed. And it goes into the newer, let me get this in here before I start talking again. That's why the I-Type was developed. I-Type goes into the newer cameras which have an onboard battery system. And so the pack itself is just the photos and there's no battery or anything like that. The SX70 film also has a battery in it, but it loads into the SX70 cameras. And this is a lower ASA. And, but I think for the most part, the film is interchangeable. But if you use 600 film, you have to use a, like an ND slide into it. So I have an SX70 camera, but it needs to be reskinned and everything. So I will be doing that later and then be trying this out. But I've never shot this before, so I'm very excited. Speaking of things I've not shot, we have this. This is no longer made. As you can see, it expired in June of 1990. I got it off eBay for somewhat good price. This is like the original peel apart film. So as I was talking about, it goes into this camera and then you basically pull it through the rollers. You let it sit for, I think two minutes, which is why there's a timer here. But I want to say because this is so old, it sits longer, I think for three minutes. But anyway, you pull it apart and that's basically this. Uh, this is no longer produced except a company, I think I want to say in Germany or maybe in Belgium. Somewhere in Europe, there's a company that's bringing it back and it's called One Instant. And I think they are starting to fulfill orders, but I'm not entirely sure. But you can get stuff like this off eBay. There's the Fuji FP100C, which is I think the most popular one. And then there's the 100B, which is the black and white version. I wanna say those were discontinued in 2017. I want to say and those are like because they're so new they're the most expensive to get so but it's out there like there is stockpiles of it out there that you can get so we'll see if it gets brought back hopefully because it's kind of an interesting concept so I'm gonna be shooting this within the next couple weeks here I'll make a whole video about it and you'll find people that are trying to sell you these or the like the Kodak squares or whatever and they're like you just got to be aware of it because this is an investment if you want to shoot anything with it I don't know if there's others that are like this, but I had to get this stupid battery for it this the guy and They used to use like the mercury batteries, whatever But there's like the people on the internet. They're like, oh, it's super easy to switch out the things to accept a battery pack with like triple A's and whatnot and those videos were from like four years ago and the links that they put in the description don't work anymore. So I'll make a separate video for that and I'll highlight the battery that I got and put the link in the description because it, was, it wasn't it was difficult to find, but it definitely wasn't easy and I wasn't like, was not sure that I got the right thing. And that was like 20 bucks I think for the battery or it was like, it was pretty expensive. And I got the camera in like a, I think pretty cheap because they came with a bunch of other stuff doesn't matter this is basically just a quick little rundown of Polaroid and my interest in it you know I think that it's it's another one of those facets of film photography that's kind of accepted but not necessarily understood and I think it, it serves as a good jumping off point into the psychology of shooting film and you know, some like base level interest in that. A little bit more pointed ramble. I had notes this time. I had a direction that I was hoping to follow. I would like to continue to do stuff kind of like this, intermits doing repair things because the repairs are fun, but they're kind of like, they're obviously very time consuming. The videos are kind of hard to put together at times because I'm like, what should I include? And I'm say, speaking gibberish here, so. 
gonna do maybe some more of these and just kind of go from there. But I think that is about all I have to talk about for now. So appreciate you watching, sticking through this ramble because it's a long one. And uh, catch you on the next one. Mm -hmm.